So just a quick check here of where we are. Um, for April 24th, that's today, I'll be leading you through um, Exodus 7 through 10, and then next week, um, Josh will be leading through 11 and 12. So if you would go ahead and read those chapters in preparation, that would be great. You can come prepared with comments and questions. Um, but tonight we're going to get started uh, with chapter 7. And I know it's been a, about a, a, you know, a little while, so it might not be as fresh in our minds as if it was if we were going to be here last week. But chapter 6 ended um, with Moses asking God how he could possibly speak to Pharaoh. And you might recall we had some of those discussions to say, you know, what was Moses' mindset? Um, how was Moses being prepared? How was Moses preparing himself? Um, but we had Moses having sort of a moment there, and he really didn't have any confidence in his ability to speak on behalf of God. But in the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 7, God tells Moses that he and Aaron will tell Pharaoh to send the Israelites away, but that God will harden Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh won't listen. And God will do this so that he can make an example of Pharaoh, so that Pharaoh and all the Egyptians will witness God's power to control events in the world. And that's an important theme here um, for Exodus, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that with a verse that spells that out pretty, pretty clearly. But throughout this process of, of, of God putting up Pharaoh so that he can bring him down, the Egyptians will know the power of the one true God, and the Israelites will go free. Moses and Aaron, evidently heartened by this, they go to speak to Pharaoh. So given Moses' state of mind um, that we discussed last week, any initial thoughts um, on a cold open here of what you think Moses' and Aaron's perspectives were whenever they're getting ready to walk into Pharaoh? You think they were ready and raring to go um, after, after their mindsets? Probably. But when, when Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, God has prepared a miracle. God knew that Pharaoh would ask for proof that they were speaking on behalf of a deity. So God instructed Moses to throw his rod on the ground and it becomes a snake. Um, but Pharaoh called his wise men and sorcerers, and they also threw their rods down, and their rods became snakes too. Then Moses' snake swallowed up all the other snakes, proving at once whose power was ultimate, and a pretty clear example there. And this was an instance where God hardened Pharaoh's heart in order that he would not let the Israelites go yet, so that God could display his power. I'm going to come back to that theme a few times. When God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh to enact turning the water to blood, he doesn't tell Moses that this is the first of the ten great miracles or plagues that will come to torture Egypt. Neither Moses, Aaron, or Pharaoh knows that this is the beginning of a sequence of, of awful conditions and devastation for this otherwise prosperous and affluent Egyptian people. Um, all of the... Um, the plagues are, are terrifying and horrible. But the first is perhaps one of the most striking and frightening, at least to me. Um, the Egyptian people, they lived in an arid region. They lived in a desert, a desert with valuable resources of water nearby, right? They had that one water source. But to remove the water from the region would have been alarming enough in such an environment, but to replace it with something as repugnant as blood is another level of agitation. And God's design um, for this plan is spelled out. So, Mike, would you wouldn't mind please reading chapter 7, verses 17 and 18, please? Thank you. So there's a lot of implications packed into that, that brief statement. You think about how much of an invasion to their lives this was. Not only were their sources of water changed to blood, but also the water that was stored in their pitchers and buckets was also turned to blood. The fish died and the blood stank. Um, the magicians of Israel then duplicated the effect 
by coloring or dyeing on a smaller scale. That's the sense that you get when you, when you read that um, this story here. But Pharaoh's heart remains hard so that God could carry out the might of the miracles here. Then after seven days, the water returns. And if you were an Egyptian, and if you lacked hydration for a week, which you were accustomed to, how would you feel when you heard that the blood turned back to water? It would probably be a great moment of joy. And surely you would rush out to see, and you would see the water, and you'd be glad, and you would drink. But I don't know, at least for me, back of my mind, the rank blood, the bloated floating fish would linger in my memory as I drank. So at least from my perspective, this is a plague that has one of many lasting consequences uh, mentally, one that are debilitating on their, their sense of livelihood and um, their sense of, of success um, as a people. You have to meditate on the absolute power of, of God as he exerts his power over the world and how he can literally do whatever he wants using whatever methods he wants. Moses and Aaron were to deliver the message, and they did. And all the water was to be turned to blood, and it was. And Pharaoh was to be left unimpressed, and he was. And so everything is unfolding, just as God has, has said. But God's control over this entire series of events is his divine power, and it all goes to uplift and uphold his great name. Every single player on this stage receives justice, and they are all educated. Remember about Moses and Aaron and their apprehension. And remember about Pharaoh, how he's going to be set up to have a hardened heart. And the Egyptians and the Israelites, they are all brought along in God's plan for each of them through the culmination of this, this, first, this first plague. And uh, we may not see God's intervention obviously as blatantly as we will um, for something like this, but today prayers still matter, and they still change things. And the greatest miracle of all, of our salvation, is yet to be realized, of course. Um, so it's a, it's a striking vision of, of all water turning to blood. Any comments or anything to add on chapter 7 before we move forward? I would imagine so. Yes, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, and how, I mean, I don't know. You hear going without hydration for, I think you can go without eating for 10 or 14 days, 12 days. Going without hydration, I hear three to five days for a week. There's no recorded deaths, but at least in a region like that, it's hard to imagine um, that there weren't some people that really, really struggled. Zach? Right. Yeah. It was it literally blood, yeah. Mm-hmm. Starting off with a bang, as it were. Yeah, and both, both of your all's points just really demonstrate the, um, the desperation um, that must have been apparent in the people. And um, there are surely thousands of stories uh, that come about as a result of these. But let's move to Exodus 8, frogs, lice, and flies. Um, God, Moses, and Pharaoh, they continue these phases of petition um, and these phases of resistance and these phases of plague in this chapter. Since Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go after the blood plague, God sent frogs. The frogs appeared abundantly. Think about your home, okay? about where you live, about your bed, about your kitchen. 
Think about your garage, your sidewalk, your bedrooms, and your bathrooms. Frogs were in everything. Frogs were everywhere. Um, this is where they appeared. It says in their house, in their bedroom, in their bed, their servants' houses, on people, in ovens, and in the kneading bowls, like food preparation areas. Um, it's one thing to read it. It's another thing to try to visualize it, especially the one that's on people. When I think about that one, I think about, like, they're everywhere, and I'm, I'm with my wife, and I'm in my house. How are we going to get rid of all these frogs? And we're just, okay, we finally got them all out of the kitchen or the living room, and then I look over, and then she's got one, like, on her shoulder, right? Like, inescapable, um, desperate feeling of um, just being unable to overcome the plight of this plague. Um, surely, really, m- very mentally, I, I don't know, it's hard to, to say something without it seeming like an understatement, at least for me. You kind of think about what kind of effect the frogs would have on day-to-day life, on your sanity. Uh, I don't know about you, but it wouldn't take me very long um, to start feeling extremely uncomfortable. Again, an understatement, yeah, squirmy. But after the frogs appeared like this, um, Pharaoh, he relents. But he only relents in speech. And he says, um, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Remember, this was one of the earliest requests. Um, They wanted to just go outside of the camp, go three days' journey to sacrifice. And this Pharaoh is, is coming back to this. He's like, okay, I will let you do this now. And Moses, however, at the beginning of this chapter, mentions to let them go so that they may serve the Lord. So you can, under, you can get this sense now we're, we're moving away from just going and asking to go in the wilderness. We're starting to get closer to, towards we want our freedom. And that's what Moses is saying, so that we can serve the Lord. Um, whether or not that's specifically pointed towards them going and sacrificing in the wilderness or them just going and living their own lives, it's not that specific. But it, it does seem to be a, more of an expansive request. But God is starting to make good on the promise to bring his people to the promised land. And that's what the point I'm trying to make here. Exodus chapter 6, verse 8. I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. Um, and it was only Moses' first encounter with Pharaoh in chapter 5 that he mentioned the purpose of their leaving was to sacrifice to God in the wilderness. This, of course, was God's plan from the beginning, was that they could, you know, it would be a permanent relief. But let's think about Pharaoh again. You know, despite the intentions of Pharaoh's hardened heart, he's concerned enough over these great number of frogs that he agrees to let the people go. But then Moses, in a display of power, um, and it's unclear whether this is intentional or not. I, I would tend to believe it's intentional. But he's confirming that it is through Moses and God that the frogs will depart. Moses offers Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh, you tell me the time when you want the frogs to go away. And this will let Pharaoh know that it is God controlling the events. When Pharaoh says tomorrow, that's um, verse 10 of chapter 8, and the frogs die out the next day, Pharaoh's true hard heart is shown, and he does not do as he said he would. Which means he had the opportunity to believe, right? Hey, I I told Moses to get rid of them on... Wednesday, and here it's Wednesday, and they're gone. Instead of, of really believing, we see Moses is, is hardening his heart. And it's hard not to see an opportunity here um, to do an application, because I wonder if we see a little bit of ourselves in Pharaoh right here. Because when conditions are very bad in our lives, uh, for example, if we have failing health, the threat of, of loss, um, health loss, financial loss, or trouble with a relationship, we, we tend to seek relief, and uh, we tend to go to God in prayer for that. And Pharaoh is seeking relief for his people and himself when he agrees to let the people go if the frogs go away. But when God makes good on his word to remove the frogs, Pharaoh doesn't remain in that faithful state, as it were, but he retains his power over the Israelites, and he keeps them captive now that things are fixed in his mind. And I think, I think we do the same thing sometimes. We turn to God and we relinquish our control over a situation or a relationship. We lean on God in prayer to help us with the problem. But how quick 
can we be to take back control of the situation when that threat disappears? Um, that's something that is a human tendency. I think. But God remains the same whether or not we trust in him. Like Pharaoh, we usually only subject ourselves to more heartbreak and suffering when we resist following God and going to him during good and bad times. Yeah, right. He's got waves. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hit a little closer to home with the frog. And then the, where we should all be trying to get is to live in that space of self-reliance all the time. It shouldn't take calamity to push me over, over the brink. Yeah, that's a that's good. Yes. <laughs> she said, okay. That, I, I, is that worth repeating? I don't know. If the frogs were in Pam's house, she would croak, is what she said. I like it. Um, and how disgusting. Great heaps. It said they had put them in great heaps, and I think it says they burned them. Yeah, it's just, it's disgusting. Every single one of these plagues, there's an element of pure human disgust, like the ick factor, whatever you want to call it, alive and well with all of them. So after the frogs comes the lice, and not as much as mentioned on the lice, um, but these must also have been unbearable. They originated from the dust after Aaron struck the ground. Unlike the blood and the frogs, though, the Egyptian magicians were unable to reproduce this plague. When they realized that they could um, not bring forth lice, they had to admit that it was the work of God. However, Pharaoh's heart remained against releasing the Israelites. And I, the only thing I can offer on this one is I read an account of a man um, uh, that was in a foreign prison, and every morning they were given their clothes to wear that day, and every morning the clothes were riddled with lice. And so they had to spend the first um, two hours of every day getting the lice out of all the seams of their clothing before they could put them on and live in comfort. Otherwise, you're sitting in these clothes and you're just feeling them all over you. And just that, it's so uncomfortable even to describe it, but to live, in a, with a, to live like that and have that be your norm, um, extremely debilitating. So uh, with the third plague of this chapter, yes. What? What? Oh, is Nats in one of the older, uh, the King, New King James? I mean, I would only, I would only think that it has to be a nuance of translation with a small flying biting insect. Yeah, <laughs> um, I would have to dig into the Greek a little bit more to get that, but that would be my assumption. Good question. All right. Um, the larger insect, um, this is a fly's next. The flies were also mentioned for their ubiquity. Um, they would be found on the people, on the servants, on the houses, and on the ground. Exodus 8.24 says, Thick swarms of flies came into the houses of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. But what, there's something different about this plague. Anybody know what's different about the flies? That's right. It's not in the land of Goshen, the place where the Israelites lived. And we're not told that the Israelites avoided the previous three plagues. Um, I'm going to remain silent on that. Um, but we do know that they did not have to bear the flies. What a relief. To avoid even one of these plagues would have been a great blessing. This is not the only plague that the Israelites would, would avoid 
that we have on record. So why were there no flies in Goshen? Because God said it. It's his people, yes. Prove a point. He is the Lord. Yes. And that these are my people as well, I think. Um, his leaving the Israelites out of the effects of his plague shows them favor and shows the Egyptian that He's purposely punishing them, and that, like you say, he's got the ability to say, hey, I can, I can divide, and I can put them where I want to. And then finally, in verse 25, it seems that there is a reprieve as Pharaoh, he, this time he tells Moses to go and sacrifice to God. But keep in mind, Pharaoh is not allowing the people to go free, nor is he allowing them to go and sacrifice in the wilderness. But he's only allowing them to sacrifice in the land. I take this to mean, you know, somewhere with, where you could still see them. Moses says no to Pharaoh because Moses has an idea that if the Israelites perform their sacrifices in the land where the Egyptians can view, they will invite the condemnation and punishment from the Egyptians. Why? Because the Egyptians detested sacrificing sheep. That was what I was able to find. So Moses explained this to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh then let them go to the wilderness to sacrifice in verse 28. So the chapter ends predictably. Moses tells Pharaoh that the flies will depart, and they do, but Pharaoh remains steadfast in his stance against the Israelites. He does not intend to let them go, but as has been the theme for this chapter, um, God is in control. That brings us to the end of chapter 10. Um, any comments or anything? Yes, David. That's a great point. That sense of that word identity, I think, is, is really important. Um, not only are they starting to form that now in a sense of them being separated from the rest and not even attached to, now they're, now they're starting to have that separation. But we also see that theme of identity in, in God's people, and then so beautifully does it coalesce in how we wear Christ and put on Christ, and our identity is in Christ today. So, you know, we can get real big picture about it real quick, and uh, I tend to get carried away with that kind of stuff, but I think that's a great call out because this is the, it marks an initial instance where they're really starting to, to feel like as they're different, and not just a different as enslaved. All right. Um, let's go to chapter 9. Disease, livestock, boils, and hail. So as the plagues progress... So does the, the confidence and the surety that everybody has that they are from the Lord. We should remember from chapter 8 that the plague of flies was kept from the Israelites. We see the same thing with the disease plague that begins in chapter 8. Also remember how God has been identifying when the plagues would come and when the plagues would leave. Being able to accurately predict the plague timings as well as preventing one group or geographic area from experiencing are both proofs that a divine hand is at work. And I think the people, Israelites and Egypt, probably are starting to, to understand that. Um, the sequence of events for each plague has established a pattern. And, you know, just, just by way of, of establishing this, you know, humans are good at pattern recognition, so I wanted to, wanted to bring this out here. Not every step listed in, is represented in every plague, but each plague follows this general outline. God tells Moses and Aaron to tell Pharaoh to let the people go. Pharaoh is warned that if he says no, a plague will commence. The 
plague comes, decimates the region and the people, and sometimes spares the Israelites. Pharaoh indicates that he will let the people go if the plague subsides, the plague ends. Pharaoh's heart hardens against the people, and he does not let them go. And that's, that's the cycle. That's the cycle that we have. But in, in chapter 9, a disease that kills livestock comes and follows this pattern. Like the plague of the flies, not one of the Israelites' livestock is killed. Then the sixth plague of boils comes. The Egyptian magicians could not even attempt to replicate the plague of the boils. Such was the severity of this plague. One verse there it says, um, And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. Then the plague of hail comes. With the plague uh, of hail comes exposition from God on why he is orchestrating these plagues. And this is one of the biggest moments of the class tonight, I think. So I, I want us to remember this passage. Through Moses, God tells Pharaoh that he has increased Egypt and he's made Egypt prosperous so that they could be in the position that they're in now to be greatly affected by the work of the Lord and be on display as those affected when they do not follow the word of the Lord. God is doing this that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Well, to this end, God is also hardening Pharaoh's heart. So I've asked, uh, Jim, could you read Exodus 9, 13 through 17? Please? Exodus 9, 13 through So you can see if you zoom out 30,000, 40,000 feet, Egypt, Moses, the yet-to-be-named Israelites, all of it has been orchestrated over a long period of time so that the people on the earth would know who God is and who his people are. And it's difficult to look at this and not to think about the world we live in today and you know our country and the many countries around the world, and not to consider um, that God is, has a hand in the fate of nations today, just like he does here with Egypt. Um, we have the, the clarity and the benefit and the blessing of being able to read about it all these years later. Um, but I can't help but wonder and be amazed at the idea that God is doing the same thing today, right now, you know, with our nation and with so many other nations. Um, any comments or questions on that? Um, so the hail um, was devastating to the Egyptians and um, the ones that neglected to stay indoors or to keep their livestock indoors. Um, the land of Goshen, where the Israelites lived, was once again spared from plague as the hail did not fall in Goshen. But Pharaoh's attitude after the hail was the most repentant that we have, have seen yet. From verse 27 in chapter 9, he says, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. I mean, that's like, is that the same guy? Um, Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So what do you think about Pharaoh's statement here in verse 27? He's shown a pattern of um, surface level repentance. And 
right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe Moses is starting to believe and remember Pharaoh's heart will be hardened. Even though he's heard Moses' words before, now he's doing that. And I think Moses is, is understanding his, his quarry, as it were. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's also another good lesson, too, for us. Um, you know, when I repent, how deep does it go? How bad do I want it? Does it is it something that I just say and then I move on? Or because that's what Pharaoh's doing. He's saying it so that he can get the benefit. Um, and then he is just moving on once conditions improve. And it really had me thinking about my own cycle of, of approaching God for repentance um, whenever need be. How deep does it go? How bad do I want it? If I look like Pharaoh, I'm doing it wrong. But yet, we see by the end of this chapter, predictably, um, Pharaoh changes his mind again, and by this time, we are starting to expect it. Uh, David, yeah. Audience in this case being Moses and Aaron. Great point. Um, and um, you know the the real shame in that is that there's just a lack of integrity that you can't trust them with what they're saying. Pharaoh especially, and I I want to get into politics, but that would be nice to have one with integrity. Yeah. And when we see that um, blatantly, as Pharaoh does, um, shamelessly, it's ugly, it's unattractive, um, it's obviously wrong. And, and that should create, you know, within each of us, if nothing else, um, the desire to behave with integrity. That's a great point. So, but for the application here of chapter 9, I want to think about how God specified that Egypt was made great right for this moment. I mean, we still have artifacts and knowledge of that, that great society, that great culture. What we can call it great, say successful. Um, but this whole culture of Egypt was made to glorify God and to spread knowledge of his might and power over, over all the earth. If God did, did this then, we should have faith that when we are troubled in the midst of alarming current events, God is in control. We have to retain that faith that the outcome will be right regardless of how difficult that can be to accept or how difficult it can be to visualize. We have to have faith in God's plan. We practice this belief it helps to increase our faith. And um, just this idea of Exodus and Egypt being brought up in order to be brought down to glorify God's name um, is, is very enlightening when you think about our, our current state of affairs or any point in that's chapter 9. Right, Exodus chapter 10, locusts and darkness. Let's get through chapter 10 here. As the plague of locusts comes on, we have Pharaoh's servants. Now, Pharaoh's people are starting to turn on Pharaoh, right? They're, they're telling him, let the people go. All around him, people are seeing that it is senseless to keep denying the Israelites in the midst of so much suffering. 
But as we know, Pharaoh's resistance is God's doing. So the Lord is still doing this to propel the greatness of his name across the generation. Um, Derek, could you please read the first two verses? So, again, he said the same thing in a different way. These signs are so that we may know, the people may know, Egypt, Israel may know of who God is and what his power is. Now, each of the previous plagues um, have been an irritating threat to hell, um, I guess, except for maybe the, the water to blood. But other than the diseased livestock, there have been, that I could find, no recorded deaths as the result of the Plague. Certainly no human deaths have been recorded as having occurred until this time. And I, I tried to categorize these plagues as a, as a way to, to try to think about the approach towards um, really God exerting his power in, in this way. The locusts tend to fall in this bo bothersome and disgusting category of insects and, and creatures, such as flies, lice, and frogs. Pestilences in this category of plague could drive a person mad with their constant presence and their irrepressible numbers. The locusts in chapter 10 have the added burden of eating everything in their path. So now we have the destruction of a food source um, as well. Another category of the plague seems more sinister. While the first category of living pests is alive, the disease of the livestock, the boils, and the hail, all of these are not alive, but they seek to bring death to those things that are alive. The livestock die from disease, the boils decrease health, and the hail can strike and kill. So both of these categories, these first two are examples of natural things going wrong. Seven of the ten plagues are represented in these first two categories. But there are two more categories yet for us to address. I'll jump ahead and say the final and, and most terrifying is the tenth plague, death of the firstborn. Uh, we'll study that next week. But the other category of plague encapsulates the water turning to blood and the darkness. It's true that the death of the firstborn is, is probably the saddest. and That's subjective. I guess you can take that argument so far, but... As we continue tonight's study, I, I want to posit that the two plagues that are left, um, water turning to blood and darkness, these are the most frightening, representing hopelessness and despair. For while some of the other plagues represent what happens when there's too much of one thing in nature, frogs, flies, or lice, the water to blood and the darkness, they represent that hopelessness and despair. Um, Exodus 10, 21 through 23 says that there was thick darkness in the land for three days and that the Egyptians did not leave their place for this duration. So imagine it, again, we, we talked about the frogs earlier in the class. Imagine it being so dark in the place where you live that you don't leave and you don't even leave your room. Imagine the darkness stretching out for hours and hours on end. Time has no meaning as the first day melts into the next. How could you tell time under conditions like that back then? Egyptian families huddled together, frightened, as Israelites um, had light in their dwellings. How terrible it must have been to live without light, sight, or vision of any kind for, for three days. You think about you know being buried alive or being lost at sea. Those are some of the, the other kind of ideas of hopelessness and despair that come to mind when we think about the depravity of the water to blood and, and the darkness. But the story of the ninth plague that was darkness, it ends predictably. Pharaoh tells Moses that he can go, but that his flocks and herds must stay back, although the children could go with him. So making the livestock stay back was probably Pharaoh's way of making sure that the Israelites came back eventually. That's, you know, 
in preventing them from being able to have a food source or being able to take care of their own livelihood. But Moses, understandably, you know, sick of Pharaoh's behavior by now, he refuses. And he says that they will go, but that they will take their livestock. And then Pharaoh, in response, having his heart hardened by God, tells Moses to get away from him and that Moses would see his face no more. This would turn out to be true. This would be the last time that they would meet face to face. So that um, brings us to the end of chapter 10. Any, um, any comments or um, anything to add? I like the picture you paint there because Moses gets further and further and further away from his comfort zone every time it goes. But every time he does, and what God said keeps happening, his faith only gets stronger. And he can grow in that sense. And whether it was, I mean, had to have been designed to help prepare him for the things to come. And I can't help but, but think about our lives. And do we do that with our trials, with our tribulations, with whatever form they take? How much am I really stepping away from what I feel like is safe and comfortable and solely relying on God for everything? In that sense that I do that and I exercise that muscle of faith, it only gets stronger. I think that's a good place to end unless... Oh, David? Great point. Absolutely. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Excellent point. Um, all right, so for next week, it's the Passover. Passover in reality already passed? I think it did. So, yeah. So, it's next week it's not the Passover, but we'll be studying the Passover. Chapters 11 and 12. Make sure you read up on that. And uh, thank you all for your great comments, your kind attention. Appreciate it.